and there's no way we're going to sail around the clash. The confrontation is inevitable. The confrontation that is coming is between Christian fundamentalism and Malta. My question is, who creates the violence in the name of religion so that you can finally end the violence in the name of religion? We are living in very, very serious times. They want the church and the state together to regulate conscience. So this is an appeal to the Protestant world. When you look at your roots, don't give up what others were prepared to die for. I think we all know that we are living in very troublous times and there are many things happening in the world today and there are so many people speaking about the issues and what's coming upon the world and I believe there are so many false flags out there that we are in danger of losing our focus. And so I'm glad we prayed before we start. And uh, tonight I'm just going to give an introduction and then tomorrow we'll start going into the issues and then we'll look at the actual events happening in the world and how they relate to us. And some of this lecture, as you will see from the title itself and from the first slide, from Crete to Malta, referring of course to Paul's journey, from Rome, or to Rome, uh, are from past lectures. So I'm just going to recap a little bit, just to put it into context, so that we can understand where we're coming from, so that we can understand where we are, so that we can better evaluate where we're going. Amen. And we'll try to put that in a biblical, typological, prophetic context. Now Paul's last journey was a very tumultuous journey. He traveled from the island of Crete and he was on his way to Rome when they met a catastrophe and they struck the island of Malta. Do you remember that? I discussed it in a previous lecture. I'll just briefly recap. As they were approaching this island in this tempestuous storm, they realized that they were going to be shipwrecked. In Luke chapter 12, verse 37, it says, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. So the Lord wants us to watch. What does he want us to watch? And what must we look out for? Obviously, there must be something in Scripture that warns us ahead of time what is coming, and we should be watching the signs. Now, what signs should we be watching? Should we be watching all the signs that everybody out there is watching, or should we be concentrating purely on the prophetic signs? Doesn't the Bible say, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Now, why did Peter actually say those words? We have a more sure way of prophecy, word of prophecy. He was referring to the fact that he was present on the Mount of Transfiguration. And he saw Jesus transfigured before him. And he heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son. Now, 
that's a major event that took place. It was a, a sign from heaven, a celestial voice calling out, saying, this is my beloved son. And then he says, we have a more sure word of prophecy. That's quite a statement. Immediately after telling that story. In other words, what he's saying, there are signs and there are wonders and there are events and wonderful celestial happenings. We shouldn't make that our basis for where we stand in the stream of time. We have a more sure word of prophecy. That's our basis. And anything else that clouds that sure word of prophecy is a haze that the devil is trying to put in front of everything so that we are distracted and we don't see where we are going. When we are to watch, we are to watch for the prophetic signs. Now, with that in mind, we read in the Spirit of Prophecy, the third watch calls for threefold earnestness. To become impatient now would be to lose all our earnest, persevering watching heretofore. So obviously, what they've been watching in the past had, well, had bearing on the prophetic events. And what we should be watching now is exactly the same. It must be in harmony with what went before. The long night of gloom is trying. But the morning is deferred in mercy, because if the master should come, so many would be found unready. God's unwillingness to have his people perish has been the reason for so long delay. So the only reason why the Lord has not yet come is he's because he's concerned about his children. Now, my question is, where is the great majority of God's children today? Is it here in the midst of this church that I represent? Which, by the way, is a movement more than a church, although it is organized as a church. Or is it out there? It's out there. It's out there. So there's two things that must happen. They must be called, number one, and the prophecies must be fulfilled. So let's briefly look again at the shipwreck of Paul, which we've dealt before with in a lecture before, and remember that it says in Acts chapter 27, verse 14, but not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind, it's such a beautiful word, called Euroclidon. So they were in the storm. And the storm is a type of the storm that this gospel ship is heading towards. And we being exceedingly tossed with tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. In the times that we are living in, we cannot deal with all the issues that are in this church. We have to concentrate on the essential pieces. We are arguing about silly things that have no bearing on the time that we are living in. Throw these things overboard. Let's concentrate on the important things and let's carry on. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay upon us. In other words, how dark was it? Very dark. All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, we should have hearkened, and you should have hearkened unto me and not loosed from Crete to have gained this harm and loss. And I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life amongst you, but of the ship. So this ship is going to go into rough seas and it's going to experience some problems. Howbeit, we must cast upon a certain island. And this island happens to be the island of Malta. And when the fourteenth night was come, 
as we were driven up and down in Adria about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. Now, in our history, we have something called the midnight cry, don't we? And the midnight cry was to bring the second angel's message of revelation to the forefront. And that message said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Now, the parallel to the midnight cry is the loud cry. The loud cry of the third angel's message, which actually says, in addition to the third angel, says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and then the details are added of the state of Babylon. She has become a house of demons, a house of every unclean and detestable bird. So there's a parallel between that midnight and the darkness that we are in now. We're in the midnight of this world's experience. The shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, so we discussed this previously as well, people want to leave the ship constantly. They had let down a boat into the sea under color as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship. So they're pretending to be on the ship, but they're not really part of the ship. Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. That's a fascinating typology there. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, take something to eat. Now, what sustenance do we need in this crisis? We need the word. We need to go back to basics. Forget the peripheries. Forget arguing about whether the shoes should be pink or blue. Who cares? Or what the color of your hair should be, or the length of your dress, or whatever. We're arguing about all kinds of things. Who has the preeminence, a man or a woman? You know, we're dealing with big things here. For this is for your health, for there shall not a hair fall from your head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer. If we concentrate on the basics, we won't be so tempest-tossed by what's happening in the world. And what are the basics? We have to get back to our mission. We have our marching orders. We are to preach the three angels' message and nothing else should occupy our attention. We have marching orders. Do them and you'll be of good cheer. And they also took something to eat, some meat. And when they had eaten enough, in other words, when they themselves were again filled with the basics, the essentials of the final message. They lightened the ship and they cast out the wheat. That's when you can spread the gospel message. Throw the wheat out. Throw the wheat out. Preach the gospel. Preach the final message. Warn the people. And we have to get to this point where we have enough sustenance not to be tossed about by every wind of doctrine, but to have enough so that we can start casting out the wheat. That is the loud cry of the third angel's message. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea. The nations are roaring. But we're part of this world. We're in these, in these tumultuous times. People are deciding whether they should flee from the United States, whether they should do this, that, or the other, what to do in the economic circumstances. Don't we have marching orders? Let the sea do what it wants to do. It's going to go there anyway. And then what happened then? And loose the rudder bands. This is fascinating. Who's steering the ship then? If we have given over control of the ship, we so want to control the ship. We have to learn to give up the ship into hands that know where we are going. 
and the prophecies have told us there's a clash coming. And there's no way we're going to sail around the clash. The confrontation is inevitable. And it's going to come to a head. Loosen the bands. Give over the control to God. Stop stressing about this, that, and the other. And hoist up the mainsail to the wind and went towards the shore. And falling into place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground. And the forepart struck fast and remained unmovable, but the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves, and the soldier's counsel was to kill the prisoners. There will be a death decree. There will be a death decree. But if the master is at the helm, lest any of them should swim out and escape, but the centurion willing to save Paul kept them from their purpose and commanded that they which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea and get to the land. The one who wants to save the Pauls is not going to permit the death decree and he's going to save his people so we don't have to panic about these issues. And the rest, some on boards, some on broken pieces of the ship. The ship is still important. We're still clinging to the ship. It might look a bit bedraggled once it's hit the rocks, and it might, you know, have planks and pieces. Cling to them, stay on board, and all escaped that stayed on the ship. That's the basic message. And then when they got ashore, what happened after this mighty clash? And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita. They knew that the island was called Melita. Shall I repeat that? They knew that the island was called Melita. It was not called Isis. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain. So that's when the Holy Spirit will be poured out and when the latter rain will fall. And Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, laid them on the fire, you know the story, the viper came on, fastened it on his hand. Signs and wonders followed the believers. No weapon forged shall stand. So that's the basic typology as I would dare to interpret it. Now we read further, the people are asleep in their sins and they need to be alarmed before they can shake off this lethargy. Their ministers have preached smooth things but God's servants who bear sacred vital truths should cry loud and spare not that the truth may tear off the garment of security and find its way to the heart. So we have a special message. Let's strip it of the non-essentials. Let's focus on what is essential. Let's partake of the meat, which is the gospel and the special message for this time. And then let's lighten the load. Let's throw off the rubbish, which is curtailing us. Let's throw out the wheat and let's warn the people. Let's head for the confrontation. Let's have the confrontation. So let's look at the confrontation that we're heading for and let's get some background so that we get our focus right again. Where is the enemy? It's very important to know where is the enemy. Isn't that correct? We must understand the enemy. We must understand how he thinks. Otherwise, we can get confused in all these side issues. So, let's go back to basics. The only people in the world, writes Pat Shannon, who is journalist at large, says, it seems, who believe in conspiracy theory of history are those of us who have studied it. 
Then he talks about Franklin Roosevelt might have, you know, exaggerated. And then he refers to Carol Quigley, who was the Jesuit schoolmaster, if you like, of American presidents from Georgetown University. He was Bill Clinton's favorite professor at Georgetown. And he boldly admitted in his tragedy and hope that the multitudes were already under the control of a small but powerful group bent on world domination. And Quigley himself was part of that group. Basics. A small group is in control of what's happening in the world, and he is part of that group. So he's basically telling us the Jesuits are in control of the world because he himself is a Jesuit. That's what he's saying. So if I look at the news and I look at the Middle East and I look at the war on terror and all the issues that revolve around it and the economic collapse and all of these fearful things coming upon the world and catastrophes, then according to this, someone behind the scenes is in control. And if I read my Bible and I read the book of Daniel and I try to understand the prophecies and then I write or I read another good book dealing with the issues of the end time, a book called The Great Controversy, and I try and find how much is written in there about the conflict between Rome and the final message, the three angels' messages, then I will find that probably 90% of the prophecies deal with that issue. Paul deals with it, doesn't he? Talks about the man of sin who sits in the temple of God, pretending that he is God. And then he talks about all of those issues. And Daniel speaks about the little horn power. And the great controversy speaks about all of these issues and the confrontation that will take place. And we're looking everywhere except there. What's the matter with us? So, this is what he said. Now, let's ask him to give us a little bit more insight, because if he was Bill Clinton's favorite professor, who was, after all, a very prominent, and still is behind the scenes, a very prominent member of the elite, then let's see what else he has to say. He said in Tragedy of Hope, the arrangement or the argument of two parties, political parties, should represent opposed ideas in policies and perhaps of the right and the other of the left, is a foolish idea acceptable only to doctrinate and academic thinkers. Instead, the two parties should be almost identical so that the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extensive shift in policy. The policies that are vital and necessary for America are no longer subjects of significant disagreement, but are disputable only in details of procedure, priority, or method. So he's saying, it doesn't matter what party you vote for, the policy is going to be exactly the same. The question is, where is the policy heading, and who controls the policy? Now he already told us, who, he says, will control the policy. But then he continues and he says, you know, loyalty is one thing, loyalty is very important, but what you also need is dissent. You need dissent. The two need to be in a vital relationship to each other. Without dissent, basically, you will get nowhere. So he says, Now, my question is, in heaven, was it a perfect government? Was there any dissent in heaven? No. Until someone decided to introduce dissent. So, who is the master of dissent on this planet? 
is it the one who controls the forces of good or is this the one who controls the forces of evil? So the one who propagates continuous dissent must somehow fall under the power that propagates dissent. Isn't that correct? Okay. What the seal of the United States of America represents to anyone who takes it seriously is a ministry of sin. A speech by the Jesuit political scientist Michael Novak, published in 1989 in the issue America, which is the official Jesuit magazine, sums it up eloquently enough. The framers wanted to build a novus ordo that would secure liberty and justice for all. Now listen carefully. The underlying principle of this new order is the fact of human sin. To build a republic designed for sinners, then is the indispensable task. Now, we get very uh, upset when legislation is passed that seems to favor sin, and then even go so far as to glorify sin, isn't it so? And if we look at legislation that was passed in the United States, and what is happening in the world, all over the world, the same thing is happening. I mean, uh, the, the legislation regarding to gay rights and all of these issues is not an American issue. It started long ago. It's a world issue. In fact, in my country, South Africa, they just passed a law that there may no longer be any third-party legal proceeding, which always was a possibility in the past. So, in other words, if a third party broke up your marriage, and that in, ensued in... Uh, financial loss, you could sue the third party. No longer, because it is his human right to have a relationship with whomsoever he wishes. In other words, that means the sanctity of marriage is gone, right? So, the fact that they're making this possible and introducing gay rights is, is one thing. My greatest fear is that they'll make it compulsory. That would be the next step. So the underlying principle of this new order is the fact of human sin. To build a republic designed for sinners, then, is the indispensable task. There is no use building a social system for saints. There are too few of them. And those there are, are impossible to live with. Any effective social system must therefore be designed for the only moral majority there is, sinners. So the Jesuits say, let's design a society for sinners. And uh, if you don't feel comfortable in that society, well then, shape up or ship out. That's basically what they're saying. Now, let's have a look at some false flags. The media tells us who is in control and who is the troublemaker. It's uh, the terrorists in the Middle East. Who's ever been to the Middle East? Who's ever seen those countries? Who's ever traveled through Syria? I traveled through Syria from the south to the north and north to the south before it was destroyed. And before it was destroyed, I thought it was already destroyed. It, it was like going back into the Middle Ages. People on donkeys, riding around with long beards. They were so frightening, I thought the whole world would quake in fear just looking at them. Ridiculous! Ridiculous! And if you look at their society and how they live, there must be something else that is creating that false flag. No, it's, it's the Zionists who are in control, the bankers, the money men, and the Rothschilds, and all of these, they're in control. Have you heard of all of those things? Now, here's an interesting one from the Jewish Encyclopedia. The 1906 Jewish Encyclopedia described the Rothschilds as the guardians of the papal treasure. Even their Jewish encyclopedia describes them as the guardians of the papal treasure. Now this word Rothschild is of course 
a total mispronunciation. It's a, a German word, and it means Rothschild. And Roth is red, and Schild is a shield. Now, who were the ones who wore red shields in war? was the Roman army. The Roman army marched with red shields. So this is the Roman army. These are front Jews. They're not Jews. They are front Jews. They are papal Jews. So they are papal people in disguise. This is what they are. Now, where is Rome leading us to? We have to look at Rome, because the Bible says, if I look at Revelation chapter 13, there are two players at the end of time. It's the beast out of the sea, and it's the beast out of the earth. Those two. Now, all the reformers agreed that the beast out of the sea is the papal system. And it had all the components of all the kingdoms prior to it, incorporated in it. It spoke like with the mouth of a lion. Its religion is Babylonian. It has father, mother, child, just like the Babylonian religion. It has all of these intermediaries, etc. Its body was Greek. But before we get to the Greek part, his feet were bare feet, so they were Medo-Persian. So it stood on Medo-Persian feet, which means its system whereby it is organized, on which it stands, is Medo-Persian. It's Mitraism. The whole Roman system is based on Mitraism, the way it is divided into groups like Dominicans and etc., or Jesuits or whatever, that is Mitraism. And then its body, the bulk of it, its philosophy, is Greek. It's Greek. Its legal system by which it rules because there are crowns on it is Roman. So this is the conglomerate beast which the reformers all claimed was the papacy. And the second beast, according to the reformers, was still future. And Wesley wrote, just before its appearance, it cannot be far off, is the United States of America. So those are the two that we are watching. And the two are working together, according to Scripture. And the one is doing on behalf of the other what the first one will well, have as its criteria of worship. Isn't that correct? So here's a fascinating thing. That's what we should watch. And then the mark of the beast will be introduced. And the whole world wandered after the beast with an O, which means it had the mindset of the beast. Didn't walk after it. It's not with an A, it's with an O. Wandered, thought like the beast. And here the Pope calls for all religions to unite. All religions to unite. Now, can two walk together lest they agree? And that was in March 2013. And he said, what he produces and what he consumes, Francis elected a week ago as a non, first non-European pope. This was early in his tenure. The first thing he said, all religions are to unite. And he met with the leaders of the non-Christian religions, the Orthodox, the Anglicans, the Lutherans, and all of these, and others, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, and said, we must all unite. That was in 2013, 2014, just a year and a few months afterwards. The World Alliance of Religions for Peace Summit in Seoul, South Korea, 18 September 2014. Here we are, the religious leaders of the world, all the religious leaders, marching in this massive stadium and representing all of the religions of the world with a mega slogan, we are one. We are one. It was a spectacular display, which eventually led to the signing ceremony. Now, the signing ceremony 
took place in a separate hall, World Alliance of Religions for Peace Summit, and that was held on the 18th of September 2014. Now at this World Alliance, you cannot believe what happened. All these religions in the world came <clears throat> to sign the unity of religious agreement. Listen to what they said. Peace will not be achieved without our every effort. Peace will be reached when everybody makes it their duty to become a messenger of peace for their nation and their societies. Today, we are not only here in our professional capacities, but as those who carry the heart of a peace advocate within us. World peace, we the youth believe, can only be achieved when all aspects, when all people come together as one. And in the past three days, you have seen that the youth, we have done all we can within our capacity. But we are looking upon the leaders right now, the leaders of the international community, the politicians, the lawmakers, and the religious leaders to help us fulfill this goal. Signing this agreement, it may not bring peace immediately, ladies and gentlemen, but what I'd like to say is that it is a step in the right direction, and the youth need your help. So now, we will we'll proceed with the signing ceremony of the Unity of Religion Agreement. The Unity of Religion Agreement is a groundbreaking promise of religions to unite condition unconditionally and without discrimination to achieve true peace. I would like to call upon the following religious leaders to come up to the stage and join us for the signing of the ceremony of the Unity of Religions Agreement. First, Archbishop Martin de Jesus Barahona to please come up to the stage. Also, a representative of Holiness Sharukirti Panditak Hariyavari Aswam Swati Sri Bataraka to come to the stage. Also, from the Islam Shia faith, El Sharif Muhammad Hassan El Armini to come to the stage. From the Hinduism faith, His Holiness Swami Shidadanda Saraswati Ji Maharaj, the Guru of India. From the faith of Buddhism, Representative Dr. Ashin Nyani Sara, founder of the Sitaku Buddha Vihara. Would you please make your way to the stage? From the Catholic Church, Archbishop Antonio Ledesma from the Philippines. From the Anglican Church, Archbishop Patricio Inlique Viveros Robles. From the Sikh religion, Singh Sahib Jana Gurbacha and Singhji. If you could make your, way, make your way to the stage, please. From the Jewish faith, Rabbi Jeremy Yehuda Milgrom. From the Zoroaster faith, Dr. Meher Master Moose. And from the Baha'i faith, Dr. Bharati Gandhi. At this time, we would also like to call upon the host of the World Alliance of Religions Peace Summit. Firstly, Mr. Man He Lee, the chairman of HWPL, and also Ms. Nam He Kim, the president of IWPG. Let's give them a great applause.
Uh, while the proceedings continue on stage, uh, we will conduct the signing ceremony of the agreement to propose the enactment of an international law for the cessation of war and world peace just below stage with our delegations and to establish peace for the heritage of peace to be brought to all generations. We must do everything in our power to end all wars on this earth and to establish world peace according to the will of the Creator, God. Therefore, all religions must unite under God as one. We pledge in sight of God, all people of the world, and the peace advocate to become under God through the unity of religion. We hereby acknowledge that we must be recreated through God's seed so that we might be recognized as the family of God and in that likeness shine an eternal light upon the earth, loving our neighbors as ourselves. We recognize our need for repentance as well as our need to show grace to all the people of the world, grace which can be seen in the light rain and the air of heaven and through that grace lead humanity to salvation from death isn't that astounding all the world religions Hindus Buddhists Sikh Baha'i Islam Jewish Catholic Anglican signing that they have one and the same God the one that we see in the rain and in the environment. This is the pantheistic God that they have been preaching in the United Nations for eons. So they've come together. Who's missing from the signing ceremony? The hardcore Protestants. The evangelicals are missing. The Lutherans are not there. The Protestants are represented sort of with one foot by the Anglicans, but the Evangelicals and the Lutherans and the, and the rest of the central Protestant world is not present. Now, the final enemy to be overcome must be the Protestant world. And this is what the Bible tells us. And so the final conflict will deal with this issue. Now we're going to deal in this series with the events as they have unfolded already, which will show us where we are in the stream of time and where we're going. It is phenomenal to see what is happening. Ezekiel says, destruction cometh and they shall seek peace. They signed the world unity of religious agreement, while downstairs the politicians signed for the cessation of all war. So it was the religious world and the political world signing simultaneously for the sake of peace. And there shall be none. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So this is the sign that the Lord is wanting us to look out for. Where are we heading? And when comes this final confrontation between true Protestantism and this Babylonian religious conglomerate? And where is it going to strike? It's going to strike not the Sikh world. It's not going to strike the Buddhist world. It, the confrontation is going to be with Malta. Whoever denieth the Son, the same has not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. The Buddhist world denies a personal God. So it can do nothing with Jesus. He cannot be a personal deity who came down to die for you. So do all the other religions represented there except those that pay lip service, such as the Catholics and the Anglicans. Now, in my own country, the Lobel Prize winner, Desmond Tutu, Bishop Tutu, said that surely you don't believe that Christ rose from the dead. This is an allegory. It's an allegory. 
And uh, the issues with the other parties, we shall see. Fundamentalism. A form, or in America, pro a form of Protestantism that arose in the early part of the 20th century in reaction to modernism and the stresses, and stresses the infallibility of the Bible, not only in matters of faith and morals, but also as a literal historical record holding as essential to Christian faith, beliefs in such doctrines as the creation of the world, the virgin birth, physical resurrection, atonement by the sacrificial death of Christ, and the second coming. So if you believe in any of those or all of those, you're a fundamentalist. Now we've dealt with this before, I'm just putting it into context. I received a letter not so long ago, in fact, it was just before I came here, where somebody lambasted me for being a fundamentalist. And uh, he gave all the reasons as to why I was a fundamentalist and how illogical this was, since the Bible was purely allegorical. And so I felt compelled to write back to him, and this is what I wrote. Just a thought regarding that swear word, fundamentalism. By definition it means Protestants that take the Bible literally. We just read the definition, so that's what it is. So which part is literal and which is not? Is it left to the reader to choose or is it all allegorical? In which case it's a nice fairy tale. If some of it is literal, then God chose to reveal some things and to play hide-and-seek with others. There are three definitions of truth in the Bible, the Word, Christ, and the Law. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth, first definition. Second definition, all thy commandments are truth, or the alternative way of phrasing it, thy law is truth, second definition. Third definition, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Those are three definite statements in the scriptures. So my question to the gentleman was, which of these three is allegorical? Which of these three? If all are, then we're stuck with allegory. Then it's a nice story about Jesus and God loves you and he died for you and it's, it didn't really happen, it's just there to make you feel good. So you might as well live it or lump it. If one or two are allegorical, then we get to choose the cherry. For example, if I want to believe that the law is truth, such as the Jews do, but I don't want to believe that Jesus is the truth, I get to choose the cherry and I do what I want, but I don't do it all. If, on the other hand, I want to be an evangelical and I want to believe that Jesus is the truth, but the Bible... Bible commandments don't exist anymore, then I get to choose the cherry. I want to have Jesus, but I don't want the Word. Or I don't want God with it. I don't want the obedience. Then what about the Bible being truth? Now, what if they are all truth? So if none of them are allegorical, well, then we end up being fundamentalists, isn't it? So that was my answer to him. If I happen to believe all three definitions of truth, I have no choice but to be a fundamentalist. Otherwise I'm a hypocrite. Okay, so let's proceed from there. This was an interesting thing that happened in Germany very recently. A Lutheran pastor, after this great debate about fundamentalism and and what they should believe, the Lutherans, and what they shouldn't believe, finally got the courage and stood up and said, he's sick and tired of this nonsense that is being preached out there. And he said some harsh things. He could have perhaps said it in a better way. He said, uh, Buddha is nothing but a fat little man. <laughs> and he said, Catholic relics are rubbish. And he says, all Muslims are sinners. 
But there's only one Savior, and that is Jesus Christ, and the rest of his sermon was totally Christ-centered, and he said we must get back to believing what we as Lutherans believe. Now, uh, do you think that he got great support or great opposition from his church? Well, I'll show it to you, because this is the newscast, and it's in German, of course, so you won't understand the language, maybe, but we've put it there in, in subtitles so that you can see what they really said and what the reaction was. This is to me fascinating because this is going to be the issue. Als einer unserer Reporter vergangene Woche der Redaktion die Predigt eines Pastors vorgespielt hat, da waren viele von uns sprachlos. Nachdem wir darüber berichtet haben, wurde es Gesprächsthema in Bremen bis heute. Pastor Olaf Latzel von der St. Martini Gemeinde hat von der Reinheit des Glaubens gesprochen. Buddha bezeichnete er als fetten alten Herren, katholische Reliquien sein Dreck und muslime Sünder. Danach gab es heftige Kritik am Pastor und gestern schließlich meldete die bremische evangelische Kirche, dass Olaf Latzel sich entschuldigt. Die Pastorenkollegen hatten trotzdem zu einer gemeinsamen Aktion aufgerufen. Sie wollen sich distanzieren. Sebastian Manz. Keiner wollte zu spät kommen. Rund 100 der insgesamt 130 Pastoren der bremischen evangelischen Kirche. Auf den Domtreppen wollten sie heute Mittag ein Zeichen für ein Miteinander der Religionen setzen, sich abgrenzen von den Worten ihres Kollegen Olaf Latzel. Es ist offensichtlich so, dass wir damit umgehen müssen, dass es auch im christlichen Zusammenhang einen Hang Einzelner gibt, fundamentalistische, abgrenzende Äußerungen gegenüber anderen zu tätigen. Und damit werden wir uns jetzt auseinandersetzen. Wir wollen dass jetzt auch weiter diskutiert wird. Wir wollen eine theologische Debatte auch innerhalb der bremischen evangelischen Kirche. Gestern Abend kam es hier im Haus der Kirche zur Aussprache zwischen Olaf Latzel und der Kirchenleitung. Man distanzierte sich vermeintlich gemeinsam von diffamierenden Aussagen der Predigt. Ich habe gleich zu Anfang des Gesprächs Herrn Latzel sehr deutlich gemacht, dass ich um Entschuldigung bitte im Namen der bremischen evangelischen Kirche. Und es ist mir auch persönlich ein großes Anliegen, für die diskriminierenden, ausgrenzenden und gefühlverletzenden Äußerungen anderen Religionen und anderen Konfessionen gegenüber. Das ist mir persönlich sehr, sehr wichtig, noch einmal deutlich zu unterstreichen. Herr Pastor Latzel hat das aufgenommen und hat sich seinerseits dazu geäußert, dass er sich entschuldigen würde. Olaf Latzel reagierte allerdings noch in der Nacht per E-Mail. Er teilte mit, dass er sich der Meinung der Landeskirche gegenüber seiner Predigt nun doch nicht anschließen will. Die Verlautbarung der BEK ist nicht mit der Martini-Gemeinde abgestimmt worden. Sie gibt allein die Sicht der Vertreter der BEK wieder. Wenn Herr Pastor Latzel sich nur für einige Passagen in seiner Predigt entschuldigt und andere für legitim hält, als theologisch vertretbar, dann muss er sich selber dazu verhalten, dann muss sich insbesondere auch die St. Martini-Gemeinde dazu verhalten. Uns ist es ein Anliegen zu sagen, umfänglich sind alle Äußerungen, die diskriminierend und ausgrenzend anderen Religionsgemeinschaften und Konfessionen gegenüber Schulden, äh, unerträglich und die akzeptieren wir nicht. Die Mehrheit der Bremer Pastoren sieht das genauso. Aber nicht jeder findet Olaf Latzels Thesen schlecht. Auf Facebook wirbt eine Gruppe um Solidarität mit dem umstrittenen Pastor. Über 4000 Nutzer unterstützen das Anliegen. Viele sind christliche Fundamentalisten. Sie kommen aus halb Europa. Darunter auch Politaktivisten vom rechten Rand, wie die Frankfurter Pegida-Organisatorin Heidi Mund. In den Kommentaren werfen viele Unterstützer Medien und Landeskirche eine Hetzkampagne gegen Olaf Latzel vor. Der Ton ist mitunter sehr aggressiv. Das hat unter anderem Jeanette Querfurt erfahren. Die Bremer Pastorin war eine der ersten, die sich öffentlich von Olaf Latzel distanzierte. Daraufhin erhielt sie Zuschriften wie diese. Ich spreche Ihnen, Frau Querfurt, die Fähigkeit ab, als Weib beurteilen zu können, was evangelisch ist. Den Bremer Pastoren gehen solche Worte zu weit. Diese Auseinandersetzung mit den Fundamentalisten in unseren Reihen, die wird weitergehen, die ist nicht beendet heute. Ja, eigentlich geht das Gespräch jetzt erst los. Das ist ein Anfang. Vielleicht werde ich auf die Dauer noch ein bisschen fundamentalistischer und der Kollege etwas liberaler. Könnte sein. Wäre eine tolle, tolle Entwicklung. In Bremens evangelischer Kirche ist ein Streit entbrannt, wie die Bibel zu deuten ist. Nächste Woche soll er im Kirchenausschuss fortgesetzt werden. A fascinating debate. We will not tolerate fundamentalists. And all the pastoral teams of the church standing there, in all their array, with a banner saying, we are rainbow nation. 
we are one with all other religions. And this is hard core evangelical Christianity. As a consequence, many debates and the theology versus fundamentalism. And this is the evangelical church day in Stuttgart. And they spoke against fundamentalism. These are the theologians. We do not believe in zombies. Who are they referring to? To Jesus. Rising from the dead. That's a zombie. And the statements that they made are so, well, contra-Bible that I will not even put them on the screen. Some of them are disgusting, to say the least, especially the commentaries. The hatred that is growing against fundamentalism is tangible. And it's fascinating to see that the two camps are beginning to form because thousands of people aligned themselves with the sermon of Olaf and said, this is where you need to go. Jesus needs to come back into the center. And immediately they linked them to extremists with extreme political views. They are very clever in how they use the media. The confrontation that is coming is between Christian fundamentalism and Malta, the military arm of the beast. That's the confrontation. That's where our attention needs to be. Pope says Christian unity means rejecting proselytism and competition. Christian unity, the Pope is pressing for it, said Sunday that the way ahead is for various denominations to reject proselytism and competition amongst themselves. You may not evangelize. You may not preach doctrine to win people over to your point of view. Then amongst the evangelicals, there is now currently the John 17 movement. And the John 17 movement is an evangelical movement which wants to join all the evangelical churches back together with Rome. Fascinating. Our vision. The John 17 movement is, con is contagious, call to all professing Christians to relate together properly, beckoning us to embrace the final prayer of Jesus. On the eve of his death, he pleaded, Father, May all who believe in me be one, as the world will know you sent me. This final plea stands as the most authoritative strategic direction for followers of Jesus. As we respond, the church, in all her rich diversity, will emerge as the attractive city on a hill. It's such an interesting statement. Potently demonstrating the authenticity of Jesus' claim. Well, so says the founder of the John 17 movement. And just to show that it is integrally linked with Rome, the Pope sent a personal letter to the movement congratulating them and a personal video message. So I'm going to play it. It's uh, again in a foreign language, but it has subtitles. It's in Spanish. And we will analyze this. But let's first see what it basis is. Pope Francis calls for unity between evangelicals and Catholics. Division is the work of the, the devil. It's interesting, the Bible says come out and be separate. But they say this is the work of the devil. Pope Francis has called for unity amongst evangelicals, Catholics and Christians from other denominations, emphasizing that we are one in Christ. And warning that division between the groups is the work of the devil. Division is the work of the father of lies the father of discord, who does everything possible to keep us divided. Can you see where we're heading? Where the ship is heading? Is it heading for a confrontation with Rome, yes or no? That's where it's heading. And our focus should be in the right place. Sisters and brothers, may the peace of Christ be with you. 
excuse me for speaking Spanish, but my English is not strong enough to supply myself. I speak Spanish, but above all, I speak the language of the hair. Tengo en mis manos esta celebración de unidad cristiana que ustedes me han enviado, esta jornada de la reconciliación. Y desde aquí me quiero asociar a ustedes. Padre, que sean uno en nosotros para que el mundo crea que tú me has enviado. Es ese eslogan, el lema de este encuentro. Una oración para que el Padre conceda la gracia de la unidad. Este sábado 23 de mayo, desde las 9 de la mañana hasta las 5 de la tarde, voy a estar con ustedes, espiritualmente, con todo mi corazón, buscando juntos, pidiendo juntos la gracia de la unidad. La unidad que está germinando en nosotros. La, un, la unidad que comienza sellada por un solo bautismo, que todos tenemos. La unidad que vamos buscando juntos en el camino. La unidad espiritual de la oración los unos por los otros, la unidad del trabajo conjunto en la ayuda de los hermanos, de los que creen en la soberanía de Cristo. Queridos hermanos, la desunión es una herida en el cuerpo de la Iglesia de Cristo. Y nosotros no queremos que esa herida permanezca. La desunión es obra del padre de la mentira, del padre de la discordia, que siempre busca que los hermanos estén divididos. Hoy reunidos, yo desde Roma y ustedes allí, pediremos para que el Padre envíe el Espíritu de Jesús, el Espíritu Santo, y nos dé la gracia de que todos sean uno, para que el mundo crea. Y me viene a la mente decir algo que puede ser una insensatez. O quizás una herejía, no sé. Pero hay alguien que sabe que pese a las diferencias somos uno. y es el que nos persigue. El que persigue hoy día a los cristianos, el que nos unge con el martirio, sabe que los cristianos son discípulos de Cristo.
que son uno, que son hermanos. No le interesa si son evangélicos, ortodoxos, luteranos, católicos, apostólicos, no le interesa. Son cristianos. Y esa sangre se junta. Hoy estamos viviendo, queridos hermanos, el ecumenismo de la sangre. I'm going to stop it there. He said some interesting things. Firstly, he referred to the wound, which needed to be healed. And then he referred to the persecution of Christians, where Christians are being killed, irrespective of what religion they belong to. Now, obviously, that is a reference to the events that are happening in the world today, and a reference to certain groups that are hmm, doing malicious acts with Christians. Now, my question is this. Is it possible that one can be so devious that one creates situations that brings to a head precisely that which one wants to achieve because the ends justify the means? So, I want to unpack this a little bit further, and I have to work carefully. Now, he also said the following. He expressed his greatest sorrow comes from fundamentalist Christians, as well as fundamentalist Muslims and Jews. They are not willing to dialogue in any meaningful way, but instead retreat into their own camp and hurtful accusations and hateful comments. The real target is the Christian fundamentalist, because that is the one that is problematic when it comes to unity. Because if you believe that Jesus is the only way, and there is no other name under heaven and earth whereby you can be saved, then there is no way that you can equate your deity with the deity of the other religions. It's a physical impossibility. I know that there are many attempts, even in our own ranks, to do so. But the fact remains that it cannot be done scripturally. He said that if we try to build unity around doctrinal issues, we will only achieve it after the apocalypse. So doctrine must be laid aside in order to achieve Unity. Now if I go to Second John, and I read what it says there, chapter 1, verse 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So any, any religious system which denies that God became fully human is a deceiver. Now, how does Catholicism fit into this picture? Because doesn't it confess Jesus Christ? Well, yes, it confesses Jesus Christ, but in its action, it denies him. Because in Catholic theology, Jesus Christ didn't come all the way down. He didn't become flesh. He didn't become fully human. He stayed at a higher level. And that is why intermediaries between him and man have to be employed. And so the priesthood acts as intermediary, or the saints act as intermediaries, or Mary acts as intermediaries, because you have to go through them in order to get to Christ. But the Bible says he came all the way down, and he communed face to face with humanity. And he touched the lepers with his hand. When everyone else ran away from leprosy, he was the one who confronted it with his touch. And we all suffer from the leprosy of sin. And Jesus came all the way down with his personal touch to confront the leprosy which controls humanity. And that is true Christianity. Anyone who denies this denies that he came in the flesh. So Catholicism, by its action, denies that he came in the flesh. And that is Antichrist. 
Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresses, there's no, modern translations don't like that word. They change it, but stick to the old paths. Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. Didn't he just say we don't need doctrine? Because if we agree on doctrine, well, hello, then we will never, never come together. So let's put doctrine aside. But this is not what the Bible says. The Bible says, whosoever transgresses, and did they transgress? Doesn't the Bible call the system the man of sin because they've changed God's law, changed the Sabbath, removed the second commandment which forbids idolatry, split the tenth one? We know that history. Who transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. And then the Bible says, If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, that Jesus came right down to meet us on a personal one-to-one -one level, that he's my personal friend with whom I can, comp well, speak personally to him. If there come into you any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. So it seems as if confrontation is inevitable. If the Bible says that the doctrine is important, and if the Bible says that the two mindsets cannot unite, then confrontation is inevitable. And this gospel ship is heading towards the rock of Malta. Malta ahead. The woman, the church, is standing on the bow. She has thrown overboard the non-essentials of our time. She's focused and the ship is under the control of a higher authority. God is in control of this ship. Now what is gratifying to me is that in the evangelical world, I see a divide. I see a divide out there. People are taking a stand. And the issue is that these people must be reached with the final call which is the loud cry of the third angel's messages. Because if they make their stand up to this point where they are now, and they receive the persecution from the world, and they also have the confrontation from this unified religious system under the control of the beast of Revelation chapter 13, then they will also take the next step and they will accept the doctrine that it is everything in the Bible that counts. That means you accept Jesus Christ. That means you accept his law because if you love him, you keep his commandments. That means you will accept the biblical version of the Ten Commandments, which means that you will keep the Sabbath because you honor him as your creator and as your Redeemer, and your Restorer, and that you rest on the Sabbath, not because it's works, but because you're resting in a work that has been completed for you, because Christ came down to meet humanity was where it was. Catholic thinking is you have to get there in order to appease him. No, he came all the way down. Salvation is by grace keeping the commandments of God and holding to the testimony of Jesus Christ is not legalism. It is salvation by faith in the grace of God, which comes to all, and all who love him will keep his commandments. Now, as we continue the series, we will be looking at this confrontation in greater detail 
so that we can identify the false flags which have been placed in the way, or the situations, let me be blunt, that have been created in order to create this conglomerate that we're seeing developing in the world. May the Lord bless us as we study his word, and may he give us wisdom and insight to understand. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we have our marching orders and we have a sure word of prophecy. Help us to cling to this so that we may be educated. And Lord, you have entrusted us with this message not because we are greater or better. In fact, we are feebler than anyone else. But you have entrusted us with a message not only for this church to which I personally belong, but for the entire world, all the religious systems of the world, because you have children in all of the religious systems of the world. But you have a great number in the Protestant world. And I pray that by our humble efforts, many of these will cling to the word as it stands, and follow you in full obedience to your law and to the only way of salvation, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.